I grew up in this podunk town in Nebraska, and in the 18 years I lived there, only two significant things happened. The first thing, and probably the best thing, is that I was born. I know, you're all very welcome. But the second, and perhaps the worst thing that ever happened in our town, was when Kevin Meyer set his garage on fire. Or rather, maybe what Kevin did constituted the worst thing that never happened to our town, and if that doesn't make any sense, bear with me. All will become clear over the course of the next few paragraphs. So it was a Sunday night and I was in my freshman year of high school at the time, so still at that age when me and my friends would go out on our bikes for an evening. You know, good old wholesome fun. We're just riding around when we see another kid from our class riding down the street at top speed. We stop to say hey and in between panting breaths the kid's like, Oh my god guys, the Myers garage is on fire, come look! We then hurtled down the street at full speed, following the kid from our class until we're faced with this raging inferno that used to be the Myers family garage. Only, right as we get there, we're immediately told to keep back by the cops and firefighters on scene. We thought we were already at a safe distance, so we're kind of confused but did as we're told. Only then we start hearing all these pops and bangs coming from the garage, and the firefighters trying to put the flames out suddenly ran for cover. I had no idea what was causing the little bangs, but if it was scaring the cops and the firefighters, then I figured I should have been scared of it too. I actually thought the Meyer house was about to explode or something, and so did my buddies, so we had no problem getting out of there quick, riding home and telling our parents about it. The next morning at school, all the kids were talking about the fire, mainly because Kevin Meyer hadn't showed up to any of his classes. Some kids were spreading rumors saying they'd seen the paramedics loading him up onto an ambulance, and he was so badly burned that he was just a smoldering husk. Others said that he and his parents had gone to live with relatives since the fire had made their house basically unlivable, which is the story I believe because I figured there'd be actual confirmation if anyone had died. But then the next morning, there was confirmation. News reports said that firefighters had recovered one body from the burned out garage while the surviving family members were staying with relatives and had asked the media to give them some space. So, on that Tuesday, we knew someone had died, but we had no idea exactly who. The Myers had three generations living in that house, and Kevin was one of four kids. A bunch more rumors began swirling, and it was only the following day when our high school principal called us all in for a special assembly that we actually got any concrete answers. I remember the whole school filing into the gymnasium where the county sheriff and a handful of deputies were all stood in front of the bleachers, each of them with a real serious look on their faces. Once we were all seated, the principal opened up by saying that the county sheriff had something important to talk to us about, and as he stepped forward and took his hat off, I swear you could have heard a pin drop. We knew it was going to be something about the Meyer family, but exactly what it was, I'd swear I'd never have guessed in a million years. I'm not about to pretend I can remember what the guy said word for word. This all happened almost 20 years ago now, but this is basically the gist of it. Folks, you've all heard about the fire over at the Meyer place, and I'm sure you've all heard about the tragic loss of life. Well... I'm sorry to have to be the one to tell you, but your classmate Kevin was the one who passed. There was a kind of rolling gasp across the gym, and the sheriff paused for a second before continuing. Now, we're still trying to figure out how the fire started, so we're inviting anyone with any information on Kevin to please step forward. You don't have to do it now. You can call my office whenever you like, and we can have a more discreet conversation. Please, if you have anything to tell us about any strange or unusual behavior Kevin exhibited in the days before the fire, I implore you to step forward. That was the first clue we had that something was really wrong. I guess they wanted to handle the whole thing with kid gloves and I can totally understand why they might want to shield us from what they already knew. The initial reaction was one of total shock and grief. Kids were horrified that one of their own had died in such a horrible way. 
but if the cops had told us what they'd really found in there, I don't think people would have been nearly as sad. More like, angry. It took two more days for the truth to come out, and by that time, the town had decided to defer responsibility to our parents. There was a town meeting, I remember that, because my parents asked me to do my chores before they returned, and all I did was play Perfect Dark for like two hours. When they got home, I thought they'd be mad that I hadn't even put a dent into any of the stuff I had to do, but they weren't mad. They had these weird but sad, but intense looks on their faces, exactly the same ones they had when my grandpa died suddenly. They sit me down in the TV room and ask how well I knew Kevin. I tell them not much that I had Spanish class with him, but that we never talked. They then start asking me a bunch of other questions if Kevin ever got mad at me, if I liked him, stuff like that. In the end, I just straight up told them it was obvious they knew something about Kevin, and that I'd rather they just told me that it was him taking his own life or something because I was old enough to handle the truth. Turns out, I was not old enough to handle the truth. Kevin hadn't taken his own life. He'd accidentally blown himself up trying to make a bomb. Apparently, he wanted to test his method out by making a test model. But as he was putting it together, he somehow detonated the thing and made it enough of a bang to kill him before setting his garage on fire. At first, it had looked like he might have just been a firebug, you know, like a pyromaniac, and he was just screwing around with an accelerant or something. That's why it took a few days for the cops to be sure of what happened. They had to go over the burned out garage and go through Kevin's stuff to try and work out why he did it. The cops then found a journal Kevin had been keeping, one where he'd basically laid out his plan to build a bomb then put it under the church one Sunday morning while it was full of families. The cops wouldn't say exactly what the rest of the journal consisted of, only that it made for highly disturbing reading and that there were several references to the Columbine massacre of the year before. Mom was crying by the end of the talk, and Dad was the most shaken up I'd ever seen him. That kid wanted to kill almost the entire town, and let me tell you, if he'd hit the church around the upcoming Veterans Day service, he'd have killed like 90% of the people in our town, all in one fiery blast. And the most I ever got for an explanation was just, the kid wanted to hurt people, or he wasn't right. No one really bullied the kid or gave him a hard time, he was just crazy, I guess. But I also thank God that he wasn't smarter and that he didn't like put a little more research in or take a little more care, because if he had, he might have wiped our entire town right off the map. What I'm about to tell you is the darkest secret I know. I'm from a little town in the Midwest, and in that town is a cute little chapel. In the back of that cutesy little chapel, there's a small memorial to a family of four, murdered by mysterious transients who were never caught. They were all home one night when the sky broke in, then he killed the entire family while they slept. Mom, Dad, Son, and Daughter all dead within just a few minutes of each other. As you can probably guess, the murders absolutely devastated our small town. I was only in elementary school when it happened, but I can still remember the vigil, the funeral, and the ceremony that surrounded the unveiling of the chapel's memorial. It was a completely random, avoidable tragedy, an act of malice perpetrated on us by some shadowy outside evil. Only, that's not what actually happened. What really happened is like an open secret, something we all know but no one ever says out loud. It's like that because we need to protect our community, at least that's what I was told, but I'm not sure how lying about it actually helps us. It's just a veneer, a phony facade of small town tranquility. What's the point of pretending we're a quiet happy town when the reality is far from it? Okay. I guess I've been blue-balling you all over what actually happened, so I'll just get right to it. On the night in question, the family had dinner, watched some TV, 
then at some point after 9 p.m., the parents put their kids to bed. The dad usually stayed up with a glass of scotch after mom and the kids went to bed. He'd watch football or baseball highlights, binge a few late-night shows, you know, typical dad stuff. But he never got up off the couch that night. The whole cover story was that the family had been killed while they slept, and technically that's true, but it's always painted like they were all sleeping peacefully in their beds when they were killed. But that's not true. A few hours before they were murdered, the family had sat down to dinner. I don't know what they ate exactly, chicken pot pie or whatever, but I know what they had for dessert because that day, the nine-year-old daughter of the family had made everyone some of that strawberry cream-flavored jello pudding. The way I imagine it, it probably wasn't the nicest dessert they'd ever had. But geez, if my kid appeared to show a passion for cooking, baking, really anything, I'd feign enthusiasm and clear my plate. Who cares if they got the powder to milk ratio off by a little, or used a whole bunch of extra sugar when there's already a ton in there. Only, the reason it tasted off is because the nine-year-old girl had poured in a ton of NyQuil Max Strength into the pudding mix. I don't know exactly how much she put in there, or how much the parents and brother actually ate, but, but it was enough to pretty much knock them out so the daughter could put her little plan of hers into action. You see, the reason why they never caught the mysterious transient hobo murderer that chose to randomly break in and murder the family is because there never was one. After her family were all passed out, the little girl went into the kitchen and took a big old knife out of a drawer or a block. She then walked into the TV room where her dad was asleep on the couch and cut his throat. From what I was told, she cut his throat so deep and wide that he couldn't scream. All he could do was put his hands to the wound, wonder why, but he would have been dead in mere minutes. After that, she went upstairs and did the same to her mother and brother, just opened them up right there in their beds. This all happened on a Friday night, by the way, and no one even suspected anything had happened until Sunday morning when none of the family showed up to church. But even then, they might have their reasons not to attend. Could have been out of town visiting family, maybe a spur-of-the-moment vacation. Besides, this is the kind of town where everyone knows each other's business, but they also know well enough to stay out of each other's business, if that makes any sense. The point is, no one visited this family's house until Monday afternoon, like 50-something hours after the murders had occurred. The kids hadn't shown up at school, the parents hadn't shown up at their jobs, and from what I understand, the cops basically spent the morning piecing together until they realized the whole family was missing. Obviously, the first place to check out was the house itself, so a couple of sheriff deputies roll up to check in on them. What they found is pretty hotly disputed among our town's residents, and depending on who you talk to about it, one of three things happened. The first scenario is that the nine-year-old daughter had taken their own life after the gravity of what she did set in. After that, the whole thing was covered up just to avoid all the painful media attention a case like that might get. That's the simplest explanation, and I know Occam's razor tells us that's the one we should believe, but that's not what I think happened. I understand why people might want to cover it up. Having something terrible like that get out into the news would tear a small town like ours apart. But terrible crimes like that happen way more than we'd like to acknowledge, and the news always gets out. So, what was so terrible about these murders? I mean, even worse than they already were, that made people actually keep quiet about it. Like even in my case, I think I might be the first person to tell an outsider this stuff, maybe ever, but even so, the culture of silence that seems to be like encoded into our DNA, it means I can't quite bring myself to give you the names, dates, or places. And that's because all the fallout, the media circus, maybe even the prison sentences handed out, they all be on my head. But anyway, back to the stuff I think might have happened. The first alternative theory is that when the cops broke in, the girl made like she was the lone survivor, tricked the cops into getting close to her, then tried to attack them. The cops tried to safely detain her, but she had that same knife she'd used to kill her parents, and in the chaos, one of them just 
shot her. At least that's what I think. Definitely the less inflammatory of the two alternative theories, but not the one that makes the most sense to me. I buy a trigger-happy rookie who just saw the knife and opted for self-preservation, but not being able to restrain a nine-year-old girl. Seriously? I don't know. No one who propagates that theory was anywhere near the family's house to be able to hear any gunshot and trigger-happy noob cop or not, I refuse to believe they wouldn't call for EMTs after they'd just shot a nine-year-old. Then, once county EMTs are involved, the chance at a cover-up is long gone because there's a whole bunch of paperwork involved. And then, there's a second alternative theory, the one where the EMTs don't get called because everyone's already dead when the cops enter the house. No one saw the nine-year-old daughter at any point that weekend, meaning she didn't leave the house to buy groceries, visit the diner, nothing like that. So, what was she eating? And how did she die? According to some, the answer to both questions is pretty messed up, and the worst thing, they're the same answer. The nine-year-old died after attempting to eat the body of her dead father. She died because trying to eat her own dad made her sick, Sick enough to not be able to hold anything down, water included. I'm not a doctor, so I can't exactly say how that would actually kill a person, maybe dehydration, but by the time the cop kicked down the family's back door on that Monday afternoon, the little girl was dead, lying in a puddle of her own vomit and liquid feces. I know it's an awfully convenient coincidence that both officers who found the family retired and moved out of town shortly afterward, how the only two people who knew the truth just packed up and left without leaving behind any means of reaching them. But at the same time, I can see why two young small-town cops just couldn't handle what they saw that day. I mean, if the second alternative theory really is to be believed, seeing something like that would be enough to drive you mad. As you can imagine, this isn't something I can really talk about with many people. Me and my high school friends used to talk about it every so often, but always in hushed tones and never out in public where older folks might hear us. And now that my parents have passed and I live, well, someplace else, it's not like I can just roll back into town and start asking questions. We'll just put up that same wall of silence that I saw whenever anyone asked what happened. Darn tragedy. Such a shame. Hope they catch the guy one day, they'll say. Then one day, when everyone who knows the truth is dead... The comforting lies they told about their murders will become just another version of the truth. All that evil that found its way into the body of a nine-year-old girl will all just be forgotten. And maybe, just maybe, that's exactly what needs to happen. My family owns a log cabin down just outside of this one stoplight town called Marble in North Carolina. It's kind of a family heirloom, one we're reluctant to get rid of since it's where our family originates from. And I think another reason we haven't sold it is that there's a very interesting story attached to this place. Well, interesting to the neutral observer, but it must have been pretty darn scary for my grandma, who was the one to actually live through it. So... It's the summer of 1998, two years before I was even born, and my grandma is out at the cabin on her lonesome. My grandpa passed before I was born, but almost every summer they were together, my grandparents would go out to that cabin and just spend two weeks with nobody but squirrels for company. After grandpa passed, she carried the tradition on as a way of dealing with the grief, and that's how she came to be there, alone in like June or July of 98. Now, she didn't have a TV out there, but she did have an old radio she used to listen to her old radio plays on some now old defunct station. The station, like most others, used to take little breaks for news broadcasts, and one day, she hears about these bombs that have been going off in Georgia and Alabama. The cops had a suspect they wanted to talk to, but he'd gone on the run and was possibly hiding out in the hills of his home state of, you guessed it, North Carolina. The news guy then gives a brief description of the suspect, which was, I don't know, medium height, dark hair, lightish eyes, and says the guy's name is Eric Rudolph. 
My grandma used to say that the name stuck with her mainly because of the Christmas song about the reindeer and she found herself whistling the thing even though it's bad luck in the middle of the summer. Anyways, a few hours go by, the sun goes down and grandma is just chilling in the cabin doing whatever grandmas do. Then all of a sudden, there's a knock at the door. Grandma wasn't expecting anyone and the only neighbors she had were like a mile down the road so it's with understandable trepidation that she got up and walked towards the cabin's front door. Upon opening it, she sees a guy of medium height wearing a baseball cap with lightish eyes and a dark mustache. Grandma, being the kindly soul that she was, wishes him a good evening and asks what she can do for him. Uh, good evening, ma'am, he says. I'm so sorry to bother you, but I need to ask you a small favor. He goes on to ask my grandma if she has any food she can spare. His story being that he also owned a cabin in the area and had come out to visit his property. Only because he'd set off after work and forgot to pick up groceries for his cabin, he ended up being without food for the night. The way grandma tells it, the guy was just so darn polite with her that she just like instinctually invited him inside without really thinking it through. She usually kept her pantry stocked with all kinds of dried and canned goods, so she always had something to spare, and she says filling up this guy's backpack with jerky and peaches when she looks up at him and stops. I didn't catch your name, Grandma said. My name's Bobby, ma'am. Bobby what? Grandma asked. Bobby Randolph, the guy replied. Randolph? She said that name rang alarm bells in her mind. It wasn't quite Rudolph, but it was awful close. Close enough for her to get this real bad feeling down in the pit of her stomach. Bearing in mind, this is way before cell phones, and the cabin didn't even have a landline connection to it. The most effective form of outside communication Grandma had was a freaking flare gun. And if her situation was as bad as she thought it was, a flare gun wasn't quite going to cut it. So instead, Grandma played along. She knew if she just played dumb, gave the guy some food and led him on his way, she could drive into the town first thing in the morning and tell the cops who had stopped by at the cabin. But then, right as she's about to politely ask him to move along, he says something like, Actually, I got a small favor to ask. Do you have anywhere I can lay my head for the night? My grandma always said there was like this stalemate moment where she looked at Bobby, saw the wild desperation in his eyes, and tried her hardest to keep her cool as she said, I'm sorry, I just don't have the room to spare. Then Bobby reaches into his jacket, pulls out a pistol, and says something like, I'm sorry, I was hoping you wouldn't say that. Then nods to the gun and says, Don't make me use this. And for those of you that haven't figured it out already, the guy at her door wasn't Bobby Randolph or whatever dumb fake name he'd given her. The man in her cabin was Eric Rudolph, the Olympic Park bomber himself. Grandma says it was one of the scariest experiences of her life, but not for the reasons you might think. You see, she said she was never afraid to die. She was in her mid-70s at the time and I think she'd squared things away with God a long time prior. Instead, she said the scary thing was how weirdly normal this guy was. Even after the metaphorical mask came off, the guy remained polite and cordial with my grandma and even offered to help out with chores and stuff in the morning. Obviously, she told him she was more than capable of looking after herself and she definitely didn't want the FBI thinking she was okay with him staying there overnight. But even so, he wasn't anything like the unhinged maniac she had imagined after hearing the news report. My grandma used to say the only time he really gave a hint of who he was or what he'd done was when they said grace before they ate dinner. She could never remember exactly what he said, only that it was something about how the righteous will prevail. This was a guy who just tried to kill literally hundreds of people in a series of horrific bomb attacks so I can understand why hearing him basically referring to himself as righteous really creeped her out. Hey, it creeps me out just thinking about having to eat dinner with him. I don't think I'd be able to eat a bite, so 
it might not come as a surprise to hear that Grandma barely touched her food. She barely slept that night either. She took the bed while Eric apparently took the floor, and the whole time she expected to suddenly hear rotor blades when some chopper-mounted spotlight lit up the house like it was Broadway. But nope. No FBI guy showed up, and she says she must have nodded off in the end because all of a sudden, it's light outside, and Eric is nowhere to be seen. She said she was so exhausted from that whole thing that for a second, she wandered around the cabin like, did I dream that? And then she finds this note on a countertop, one scribbled in pencil that just said, thank you, God bless, and she knew it had actually happened. I know this isn't your typical scary story because despite having to share her cabin with a verified monster, I don't think my grandma was in any serious danger. Maybe if she tried to call the cops or something, maybe if she, like, forced his hand, then maybe he'd have actually hurt her. But she was old. She was no actual threat to him, and, and he knew well that the cabin had no phone line and nothing like that, or he wouldn't have showed up there in the first place. She even said it herself. She wasn't scared to die, and she just sort of knew he wasn't about to hurt her. But like her... The thing that creeps me out and my sister out about Grandma's close encounter is how normal the guy seemed. We like to imagine that terrorists and people like them are these vile, evil, soulless monsters that just stew in their own hate all day. Maybe that's true for some of them, but the idea that the evilest of us are just like us, that's what really scares me. Central New Mexico is home to a small town with a rather unusual name. Originally called Hot Springs, the town changed its name in 1950 after a popular radio host announced that he would air the show's 10th anniversary episode from the first town that named itself after his radio show. So, on March 31st of 1950, Hot Springs officially changed its name to Truth or Consequences and the program's 10th anniversary show was held there the following night. Truth or Consequences, or TRC as it's sometimes called, was home to only 4,700 citizens back then, and the population hasn't exactly ballooned since, but as of 1970, the population has been steadily on the rise. However, between the years of 2000 and 2010, the town saw its first population decline in more than 40 years, with almost a thousand people picking up sticks and moving elsewhere. So what could be to blame for such a drastic drop in the population? Well, it might have something to do with a man named David Parker Ray. Born on November 6th of 1939 in Bellin, New Mexico, David and his older sister Peggy grew up in the care of their paternal grandfather. Their father was a drunk, and a violent one at that often visiting the children while under the influence of alcohol. David recalled a time when his father gave him the gift of an adult magazine depicting violent imagery. Naturally, David yearned for the presence of his absent father, and given that the magazine was one of the few gifts his father ever gave him, he cherished it. The impressionable young boy became fascinated with these images, and just like any male child of his age, he wanted to be just like his dad. The introduction of such concepts to David's psychology were devastating to his social development, as he found it impossible to communicate the ideas in his head with his peers who attended the nearby Mountain Air High School. The social awkwardness led to David being bullied by a handful of his fellow students, something which further compounded his deep-rooted personal problems. Following his high school graduation, David enlisted in the U.S. Army and worked as a general mechanic in Motorpool before later receiving an honorable discharge. During this time, David was married and divorced four times, and although it's not clear why each of these divorces occurred, it's quite evident that he had a great deal of difficulty maintaining romantic relationships. In the months that followed his final and perhaps messiest divorce, David Parker Ray had something of a midlife crisis and spent more than $100,000 on a special project he would come to call the Toy Box. 
The toy box was a modified semi-truck trailer with a plain white exterior, but inside, it was anything but plain. Ray had spent a huge chunk of that hundred thousand on completely soundproofing the trailer, as well as making the thing almost impenetrable and inescapable. He then spent another sizable amount on an old gynecologist chair, the kind used by special doctors to determine the well-being and health of a woman's reproductive organs. The chair comes complete with leg supports, additions, which David modified to be more like leg restraints. On one wall of the trailer, David mounted a tool rack, adorning it with a variety of whips, chains, pulleys, straps, clamps, surgical blades, saws, and even manacles designed to keep a person's legs spread. David has also outfitted the trailer with a number of torture devices, including a portable generator he used for electroshock torture and detailed diagrams showing methods and techniques for inflicting the maximum amount of pain. Yet even in light of such a disturbing collection of toys and tools, perhaps the most disturbing thing about the toy box is the fact that David had basically turned the entire ceiling into one giant mirror. Not only did he want to torture and violate his victims for hours on end, he wanted them to be able to watch it happening. From 1957 to 1999, David Parker Ray has said to have kidnapped, tortured, and killed up to 60 different women and girls, with almost all of them being residents of New Mexico's Sierra County. The things he did to them are frankly unspeakable, and it's suspected that many of his victims simply passed away as a result of the brutal torture, long before Ray had any intention of killing them. He confessed to setting dogs on his victims, drugging them with cocktails of sedatives and hallucinogens to exacerbate their terror before he subjected them to days of pain and violation. When he became bored with his prey, David would inject his victims with a combination of sodium pentothal and phenobarbital, an amnesiac cocktail designed to basically wipe their memories. Then he'd drive them out into the desert, kick them out of his car, then move on to planning his next abduction. According to David, he did this over and over again, using a simple but effective modus operandi of either visiting a nearby bar to spike his victim's drinks, or impersonating a police officer in order to place them under false arrest. This worked time and time again, and if his confession is to be believed, David Parker Ray is probably the most prolific serial offender in the history of the United States. But his reign of terror came crashing down when he came across one victim who'd proved much more resilient than most others. Her name is Cynthia Vigil Jaramillo. In March of 1999, Cynthia was approached by David in the parking lot of the Blue Water Saloon in the nearby town of Elephant Butte. Now, I'm not casting any aspersions on Cynthia or the choices of her past, but it's a good chance that she said yes when David asked if she'd sleep with him for money, as she didn't struggle or complain when he announced that he was an undercover police officer and that she was under arrest for the solicitation of being an escort. And David then placed Cynthia in the back of his car, where she must have assumed he was about to drive her to a nearby police precinct, so we can only imagine her horror when she realized she was being taken to truth or consequences and the toy box that lay hidden in plain sight. If Cynthia didn't start to resist when she saw the trailer, she most certainly freaked out once she laid her eyes on the horrors inside it. Then, either using some kind of sedative or by using brute force, Ray knocked Cynthia out, then got to work restraining her in the modified gynecologist chair. When Cynthia woke up, she heard the sound of a tape recorder playing a pre-recorded message. It was the voice of David Parker Ray. Hello there, the tape said. Are you comfortable right now? I doubt it. Wrists and ankles chained, gagged, blindfolded, disoriented and scared too, I would imagine. Perfectly normal under the circumstances. But for a little while at least, you need to get yourself together and listen to this tape. I'm going to tell you in detail why you've been kidnapped and what's going to happen to you and how long you'll be here. I don't know the exact details of your capture, he continued, because this tape is being created in July 23rd of 1993 as a general advisory tape for future female captives 
but it's based on my experience dealing with captives over a period of several years. Now, you are obviously here against your will and you're either very scared or very angry. I'm sure that you've already tried to get your wrists and ankles loose, but you can't, because you've been snatched and brought here for us to train and use you as a slave. Sounds kind of far out, right? And I suppose it is to the uninitiated, but we do it all the time. It's going to take a lot of adjustment on your part, and you're not going to like it. But I don't care about that. You're going to be kept chained up like an animal, and used until such a time as we see fit. Me and my lady friend are very selective when we snatch a girl to use for these purposes. It goes without saying that you have a fine body and you're young. The lady friend David was referring to here was named Cindy Hendy and later received a sentence of 36 years for her role in the toy box torture. Hendy would often act as a kind of scout, singling out vulnerable young women who might not be easily missed. She also participated in the torture from time to time, but was nowhere near as sadistic as David Parker Ray. Here, David explained to his captives, your status is no more than of one of the dogs, or of one of the animals out in the barn, the tape continued. And like the rest of our animals, you will be fed and watered and kept reasonably clean. We take four or five different girls each year depending on our urges. We're always looking. Occasionally some sweet little thing will be broke down on the side of the road, walking, bicycling, jogging. Anytime an opportunity like that presents itself and it's not too risky, We'll grab her, even if we've already got a captive in the playroom. After all, variety is the spice of life. Although you're going to be a lot of fun to play with, I will get tired of you eventually, but if I killed every girl we kidnapped, there'd be bodies strung all over the country. I don't like killing a girl unless it is absolutely necessary, so I've devised a safe alternative method of disposal. After we get completely through with you, you're going to be drugged up real heavy with a combination of sodium pentothal and phenobarbital, both hypnotic drugs that will make you extremely susceptible to hypnosis, auto-hypnosis, and hypnotic suggestion. After that, you're going to be kept drugged a couple of days while I play with your mind. By the time I get through brainwashing you, you're not going to remember a thing about this little adventure. You won't remember this place, us, or what has happened to you, and there won't be any DNA evidence because you'll be bathed. After that, you'll be dressed, sedated, and turned loose on some country road, bruised, sore all over, but nothing that won't heal up in a week or two. The thought of being brainwashed may not be appealing to you, but we've been doing it a long time and it works, and it's the lesser of two evils. I'm sure that you would prefer that in lieu of being strangled or having your throat cut. Just when you think the tape can't get any more disturbing, David begins to lecture his captive on the improbability of them being rescued. Undoubtedly, somebody's going to be looking for you. There might even be a missing persons report, he says before stating. But nobody's going to be looking for you here. There are not going to be any knights in shining armor coming to rescue you. You are strictly on your own, and I bet that's a very scary thought. As for escaping, I'm sure you'll try to figure out a way. That's human nature. Consequently, you are going to be kept in an environment more secure than a prison cell. A steel collar is going to be padlocked around your neck. It is a long, heavy chain that is padlocked to a ring in the floor. The collar will never be removed until you are turned loose. It's a permanent fixture. As I've already said, you'll be fed and watered on a regular basis. Not much, but enough to keep you healthy. During the first few days, until you adjust to it, you're going to feel weak and you'll be hungry all the time, but I prefer to keep you in a weakened condition anyway. I realize that being abducted and forced into slavery is a hard pill to swallow. Some girls really have a lot of trouble with that and I'm sure you will too, but face it, you can't get away, you can't say no, you won't be able to struggle or resist. A scary thought? Yes, but you simply have no other choice but to take it. There's not many rules and they're very easy to remember, but you're still going to make mistakes. Every slave does. 
but I don't like repeat offenders. It gets me very upset. Some girls tend to be a little rebellious, and I sure wouldn't advise that, because it will get you in serious trouble. If necessary, I'm capable of doing things to your body and torturing you in ways that you can't even imagine. The playroom is equipped with a full set of surgical instruments which I have had occasion to use and will again as necessary. If you bite me, I'll pull your teeth out with pliers. If you scratch me, I'll pull your nails out. It may sound harsh and cold, but if you give us too much trouble, or if you pose any kind of threat to us, I won't have any qualms about slicing your throat. Towards the end of the tape, David seems to have taken on a sickeningly reassuring and perhaps supportive tone, urging his prisoner to survive. Be nice. Keep your mouth shut. Learn the rules and survive, he says. No matter how painful it is, nothing that we plan to do to your body will cause any serious or permanent damage. I'm not lying to you or trying to make it sound easier because that would be pointless. I'm just telling you like it is. As far as needles go, they'll always be sterilized. The clamps are going to hurt, but that won't cause any permanent injury. They don't even break the skin. David then finishes with, Just take it day by day. Be smart and be a survivor. Don't ever scream. Don't talk without permission. Be very quiet. Be docile and obedient and by all means, show proper respect. Have a nice day. We can only imagine how utterly terrified Cynthia would have been, having been forced to listen to such a thing, and for just the 72 hours that followed, she was subjected to some of the most nightmarish physical and psychological torture imaginable. On the third day of her captivity, David had to spend the day at work, so he left Cynthia in the care of his accomplice, Cindy Hendy. At some point, Cindy walked into another room of the trailer to answer a phone call, leaving her prisoner temporarily unsupervised. By that point, Hendy was getting far too comfortable with Cynthia's obedience and, in a white-hot moment of realization, Cynthia noticed that her captor had left the keys to her chains on a nearby table, just within her reach. She reached for them, lifting the keys from the table as quietly as possible before attempting to free herself. But right as Cynthia was making her escape attempt, Cindy Hendy walked back into the room, flying into a rage when she saw what was happening. A vicious struggle ensued, with the two women scratching and biting each other as chains rattled and the trailer rocked. Cindy managed to fight her way out of Cynthia's grip for a moment, grabbing a nearby lamp before smashing it over Cynthia's head. The captive woman was dazed and bloodied, but in the brief reprieve, she too had managed to grab a weapon, and when Cindy lunged at her again, Cynthia plunged an ice pick into her captor's neck. Cindy collapsed to the floor, gurgling as blood leaked into her airway, but Cynthia didn't hesitate. She unlocked her chains, took the padlocks off the door to the toy box, then hurtled towards the nearest highway wearing nothing but that steel slave collar that David had forced on her. Cynthia soon arrived at the home of a good Samaritan who took her in, called the cops, then consoled her while they waited for them to arrive. It was the end of a three-day nightmare, one she'd never fully recover from, but thankfully, her valiant escape signaled the end of David's decades-long rampage. The police used Cynthia's testimony to swiftly track down the location of the toy box and took both David and Cindy into custody. They were detained, questioned, and charged, but in the course of the police investigation, a shocking web of familial collusion was discovered. David Parker Ray had actually videotaped the torture of some of his victims, compiling a chilling library of homemade horror films. They were supposed to be for posterity, but they ended up being used as evidence against him. One of the girls on a videotape from 1996 was found to be named Kelly Garrett, who police managed to track down thanks to the tattoo on her ankle. Kelly then told police that on the night she'd been abducted, she had a fight with her husband and decided to go out drinking with friends. One of these friends was named Jesse, and Jesse just so happened to be the daughter of David Parker Ray. Not only was Jesse the daughter of David, she was also his accomplice, and she later admitted to deliberately taking Kelly to the Blue Water Saloon, her father's favorite hunting grounds. 
While they were there, Jesse drugged Kelly's drink with intoxicants provided by her father, and as Kelly staggered outside feeling nauseous and woozy, she was rendered unconscious by a blow from behind. After days of torture, Kelly only escaped because David believed he'd crossed the line and tortured his victim to death. However, upon noticing that she was still breathing, he slashed her throat, then dumped her body unceremoniously at the side of the road. He was later amazed to find out that she had survived the ordeal, but was surprised it hadn't made the news. This is because, to put it bluntly, no one believed Kelly's story. Her husband accused her of cheating on him and filed for a divorce, while local police seemed to put it down to a lover's quarrel and failed to properly investigate the incident. David Parker Ray's trial was a long and tumultuous affair, but in 2001, he accepted a plea deal to serve 224 years in prison for the abduction and torture of three young women, Cynthia and Kelly being two of them. Then, on May 28, 2002, David was taken to the Leah County Correctional Facility in Hobbs, New Mexico to be questioned by state police concerning his involvement in a number of other crimes. He died of a heart attack before the interrogation took place, collapsing in front of correctional officers, never to arise again. Ray's daughter, Jessie Ray, also was tried on charges of kidnapping and was eventually sentenced to two and a half years in prison and was released sometime in the mid-2000s. Cindy Hendy, on the other hand, after becoming eligible for parole in 2017, was eventually released in 2019. This is the same woman who gladly smashed a lamp over another person's head simply because they dared to be free of her tyrannical sadism. And now, she's free to walk the streets, the same streets that are walked by those she chose to victimize. The small Wyoming town I'm from has this old bridge nearby, one which all the kids say is haunted. There aren't any ghosts there, no haunting apparitions that suddenly appear as you're trying to cross it at night, but take it from me, it is haunted. And the only way anything can ever really be haunted. Because a long time ago, two girls from our town happened to be walking across the bridge when a car with two men in it pulled up next to them they asked the girls if they wanted to ride home, and they accepted. Only instead of giving them a ride home, the men did terrible things to the girls. Beat them, violated them, just god-awful things. And then when they were done, they threw both girls off the bridge and into the water below. That's a hundred foot drop, by the way. No one has any right to fall that far into those choppy waters and live to tell the tale, but somehow... By some pure miracle, the older of the two girls washed up on the riverbank a few miles down, coughing up the lungful of water she had in her before limping off to get help. It was a huge story. I mean, I was only just a kid at the time, but I remember the aftermath of it like it was yesterday. The girl who survived ended up leaving Wyoming, and I'm not anyone who could blame her for wanting to escape the memory of something like that. But then, years later, she came back. She had a husband, or maybe he was her boyfriend, but I know they had a kid with him, and that it was probably hers. And at the time, I figured she maybe just gotten past what had happened to her, and that she wanted her kids to be close to its grandparents or whatever. Everyone was glad to have her back, I remember that much, and for a while, the small family seemed to be settling in nicely. Then one day, I remember my wife getting a call from one of her friends she worked with down at the preschool. The surviving sister and her family had been out walking near the old bridge and, as her baby daddy had put it, one minute she was there, the next, she was gone. She'd come all the way home with her new family in tow. She had everything to live for. But one look at that drop down to the river and all those horrible memories must have came rushing back to her. I think they call it survivor's guilt when you just can't reconcile walking away from something that took a loved one or a friend. I've heard it's the same thing that drives military veterans to taking their own life, just thinking they deserve to live when someone dear to them didn't ever get to come home. To me, what happened out of that bridge 
like 20-something years apart. It's scarier than any horror movie monster you can think of. I think it might be scarier than any real-life serial killer, too. The bridge called her back to it. I don't know how, but it did. It's like she wasn't really meant to have survived that first fall. Like she somehow cheated death. But in the end, she gave up what was owed. An inescapable fate. Yeah, I guess I think about it way too much. But can you blame me? Maybe it's not just the bridge that's haunted by what happened. Maybe I am too. Hey friends, thanks for listening. Click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. I release new videos every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 7pm Eastern Standard Time. If you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit r slash let's read official and maybe even hear your story featured on the next video. And if you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations and bonus content over on Patreon, or click that big join button to hear about the extra perks offered for the channel. And check out the Let's Read podcast where you can listen to all of these stories in big compilations and save huge on data, located anywhere you listen to podcasts. All links in the description below. Thanks so much, friends. And remember, some of us are expecting 10 inches tonight. Snow.